research that I want to share. Sometimes I find some research that I want to share, and it's the quickest way to get it out there is on my Facebook. So <laughs> feel free to follow uh, the Facebook page and then go to the website if you have any additional questions or concerns. All right. So there are many reasons a child may struggle to learn to read. So a thorough evaluation is important. Um, when a child is struggling to acquire reading, struggling to read, to unlock the code of reading, to recall sight words or whatnot, there can be a variety of reasons why that may be the case. And, um, I, you know, maybe it's because it's what I do as a clinical psychologist in practice. Um, you know, most of the time I'm doing the learning and uh, attention evaluations. Um, if y'all can make sure that you're on mute, please, real quick. Just check your computers that you're on mute. Thanks. So, um, Dr. Chase, just, yes. um, I think, or if you're trying to, you haven't progressed through the slides. So oh, you're just not making seeing it. Um, well, we're still on the, the main slide. Okay. I am okay. seeing my first slide. So let's try one other thing. Oh, yes. We're, if you mean to be, you're on the helping your struggling reader, reader slide. Right. And then okay. our, I'm going to start the slideshow. So did you yep. see, do you see our pictures? Yes. Yep. And there's the first slide. Yep. Yeah. Okay. So now it's okay. working. You're good. Okay. Technology. Excellent. Yep. Yes. Thank you. So, um, and I think this version that I have, I'm not going to get the same animation. So y'all are going to get all the words on the slide <laughs> at once and I'll start at the top. So many reasons a child may struggle to read. Um, it could be actually attention. It could actually be vision. It could actually be um, a language disorder, or it could be a reading disorder. So in my view, a full evaluation, a thorough evaluation is, is really important to find out what might be going on and what might not be going on. Um, but research does suggest that the most common um cause of a reading problem is dyslexia. And dyslexia is a language-based learning disability. Let me see if I can, there we go, move my closed captioning because it's blocking my screen. Um, it's a cluster of symptoms. Dyslexia is actually a cluster of symptoms which result in people having difficulties with specific language skills, particularly reading. And students with dyslexia usually experience difficulties with other language skills as well. So spelling, writing, pronouncing words. So this is information from the International Dyslexia Association. Um, I speak nationally and in fact throughout Canada, so I guess internationally, um, on dyslexia, as well as other learning and attention disorders. And each state and you know different countries will have different definitions that are slightly different. But for the most part, um, in fact, I was just talking to, I was doing an interview with someone today who was trying to understand more about dyslexia for a national organization. And I said, it's kind of like mac and cheese. Like, you know what mac and cheese is, but whether you like Kraft or Velveeta or homemade or store brand, right? So you, you essentially know what dyslexia is, but some of the subtleties might be different in the definitions. So dyslexia occurs in people of all backgrounds and intellectual levels. So people with dyslexia can be very bright. They are often capable of even gifted functioning in areas like art, computer science, design, drama, electronics, math, and so on. Uh, they can actually have very high IQs. In addition, one of the other things we know is that dyslexia itself runs in families. Parents with dyslexia are very likely to have a child with dyslexia. And for some people, their dyslexia is identified early. For other people, it goes on until they're full grown adults. And maybe they've kind of always known that they struggled with reading, but they were never identified. Uh, hopefully, hopefully people are not saying that in 30 years. Um, let's hope because we know what it is and we know what to do about it. So Dr. So what, Chase, yeah. you're, you're still on slide two. Um, I know, but you know what? I think I can probably, um, you keep going. I'm going to take over slide sharing. If you can call it up. Yep. Yeah, great. Yep. It'd be great. Yep. I'm not sure. But you can keep going. It'll take me a minute to pull it up. Great. Well, I need my slide to know what I'm saying. So let's Oh, sure, sure. That's all right. I think what I should have done is downloaded it when you emailed it back to me and presented from the download. Okay. So 
the symptoms symptoms of reading disorders um you know can vary and the symptoms of reading disorders will depend upon um the age of the child and other variables but some of the things that we know that we're looking for in preschool students would be delays in learning to talk difficulty with rhyming or difficulty remembering common um you know, nursery rhymes and, and poems and things that are, are pretty common to children. Difficulty pronouncing words like biscotti for spaghetti or lawn lower for lawn mower, mixing up the sounds of words. Poor auditory memory for nursery rhymes and chants. Difficulty adding new vocabulary words. Inability to recall the right word or word retrieval. So they may use a lot of non-specific words like thing or thingy or that over there, whatever it is. Trouble learning and naming letters and numbers and remembering the letters in his or her name. So difficulty um, retrieving the right letters that go with the certain sounds or things like that. And then aversion to print. We don't often see this, but it can happen where kids don't like to sit on mom or dad's lap and read. They don't like to follow along with a book if it's being read out loud. What are some of the red flags we're looking for in kindergarten and first grade? Difficulty breaking words into their smaller parts or their syllables or their phonemes. So as a neurotypical language uh, development or person with neurotypical language development, you understand that there are so many sounds in a word or there are parts of words. So baseball can be pulled apart into base and ball, or napkin can be pulled apart into nap and kin. And so one of the ways we evaluate this in the office is to say something like, say baseball, and the child would say baseball. And you say, okay, now say baseball without saying the word base. And their job is just to give you the word ball. But this idea that words are made up of sounds or segments is, is not as natural to them as it is to a neurotypical person. Difficulty identifying and manipulating sounds in syllables. So man sounded out as mm, eh, mm. There are three sounds in the word man, but a student with dyslexia, a person with dyslexia, if you said, how many sounds are in the word man? They're more likely to say, what? It, it's man. So, okay, but there are three sounds in the word man. What are those sounds? Man, mm, eh, mm. Their brain doesn't think about it as different sounds. Difficulty remembering the names of letters and then recalling the sounds that go along with the letters. Difficulty decoding single words or reading single words in isolation. So rather than a sentence or a picture book that has some cues as to what the words might be because of the pictures, they just a word on paper, struggle to decode it. Difficulty spelling words the way that they sound or remembering letter sequences and very common words that they see in print a lot. And so I tell families a lot of the time, if your child is making errors and it's which vowel is it again, that's one thing that that's, I mean, I'm a 51 year old adult woman and sometimes I can't remember which vowel it is. But if we're talking about dropping entire sounds or adding sounds that aren't part of the word, or they're sort of in left field proverbially, that would be a, a possible red flag. Second and third grade. Uh, previous diagnostic concerns, or I'm sorry, symptoms that, that we might be concerned about, but we're also looking at difficulty recognizing common sight words, difficulty decoding individual words, difficulty recalling the correct sounds for letters, difficulty connecting the sound with the letter or the combinations, and then they might omit letters or um, add letters that don't belong. Hmm, sorry, that should be dropped down. Difficulty reading fluently. So they may read accurately, but it's very slow, or it may be that they're, here we go. Excellent. I think we're on second and third grade. Okay. There you go. Thank you. Um, difficulty reading fluently, difficulty decoding unfamiliar words, so unlocking the code of reading, 
Reliance on picture clues, story theme, or guessing at words. So they're in the vicinity of what the word might mean, but they'll guess uh, based on either a context or um, other you know, words that they're more familiar with. And then difficulty with written expression. Now, the difficulty with written expression is often because they struggle with spelling or spelling is not automatic and natural. And so they're spending a lot of brain power um, figuring out how to spell the word or they're avoiding words that they don't know how to spell. Excellent. Fourth through sixth, all the other stuff I've already talked about, difficulty reading out loud and fear of reading out loud, um, avoidance of reading, particularly for pleasure, difficulty reading fluently, difficulty decoding words they haven't seen before, um, difficulty applying the rules of phonics. So sound it out, sound it out. They wouldn't know how to do that or they struggle to do that. Acquisition of less vocabulary due to less reading. Um, use less complicated words in writing. So they might say big instead of enormous or huge. And reliance on listening rather than reading for comprehension. So they're, they're more focused on what the teacher's saying than they are reading that chapter or reading that unit. Next. Middle school and high school. So many of the previously described things along with difficulty with keeping up with the volume of work. And in fact, it is entirely possible and it happens that somebody might not be identified for the first time until medical school or graduate school or law school or college because they were able to compensate until the volume really increased. And once they're in that most academically demanding educational environment they've been in, then they start to struggle keeping up. Frustration with the amount of time required and the amount of energy required to read. Difficulty reading fluently. Difficulty decoding unfamiliar words. Difficulty with written assignments. Tendency to avoid reading, particularly for pleasure. And then we'll start to see this difficulty learning a foreign language. Um, I do see patients in my office from time to time who are at maybe a private school and they're being taught a foreign language early, could be in elementary school or middle school um, or, you know, earlier elementary grades. And so uh, from time to time, you know, we'll start to even see that at younger ages. Next. So early identification and treatment are key. And they're key to helping the individual with dyslexia achieve both in life and in their um, school world. The right kind of reading instruction and accommodations really are important. There's a specific type of reading intervention if the diagnosis is dyslexia. Now there are other reading disorders and there are other reasons kids might struggle. It could be working memory. It could be an ADHD condition. It could be, as I said, language processing. But the most common reason is usually dyslexia. And if it is dyslexia, we know what to do about that. And the um, link down that says Structured Literacy PDF, that is a link to the International Dyslexia Association's website that I just wanted to put it on there to remind myself to talk about it. The International Dyslexia Association has a website that includes a bunch of fact sheets this structured literacy PDF is the fact sheet for that structured literacy. What is it? Why is it important? How does it help uh, kids with dyslexia? And that's the right kind of reading instruction. Now, the next line that says accommodations are key, the um, link below that accommodations for students with dyslexia is another link at the International Dyslexia Association on their website, on their webpage, um, under the um, fact sheets and it talks about different common accommodations. And so depending on the age of the child and what grade they're in and things, we may be talking about permission to listen to books instead of read them. So reading with your ears. We may be recommending things like talk to text software packages. Do not just sit there and wait and see. That is such wrong thinking. And it's what we're told over and over again as parents with kids in school. Well, she's just a little bit behind. Let's just wait and see. She's a little young for her grade. Oh, it's a boy. Boys learn later. You know, all of those things that we hear. The bottom line is assessing for dyslexia is not very difficult. 
We know how to do it. We can do an evaluation. And in particular, if a parent has had dyslexia, do not wait because it's higher, the higher likelihood that the child will be having dyslexia as well. The other thing, and um, I would do a backflip if I could right now to make sure that I emphasize this point, do not let the child just be retained without doing some kind of assessment. I was like, I don't if know, I you said two years like right after class we'll work on it, but then I've got to ice. Hey, we need y'all. Oh, well, to be did on... you remind him? Can you be put on mute, please? Let's see. No, Can he I was do um it? doing stuff with other people. <laughs> there. Great. Um if if we take a wait and see approach or we just retain the child for a year and we give them the exact same type of instruction. They they will not benefit from that. A dyslexic brain, if they're dyslexic, a dyslexic brain does not acquire reading the way non-dyslexic brains do. So simply another year of what didn't work isn't going to suddenly work again. We need that specialized instruction. And so we need to really get an evaluation so that we can determine whether or not dyslexia is what's getting in the way of the reading. Trust your gut. I mean, particularly parents, trust your gut, trust your gut, trust your gut. Um, all too often, I see it um, either pediatricians or uh, general ed teachers, even, you know, special ed directors will tell families, tell students, tell parents, um, give it more time. Let's just wait and see. Oh, you don't want to pathologize them so young. We don't really know. We can accurately diagnose dyslexia at very young ages. Uh, we have tests that go down to preschool even. And so especially if there's a family history, push it, ask for testing, ask for an evaluation. If the school doesn't want to do it, there are practitioners out in the community who will do it. There are organizations who offer it. The International Dyslexia Association has a website with providers by state. You can look into that as well. Um, so I, I just strongly encourage you not to sit and wait. Next. Dyslexia is a lifelong condition. Now, I know that's a little bit, I don't know, kind of a bummer to hear, right? But when we say it's a lifelong condition, we can remediate the condition. We can do an awful lot to go in and train the brain how to read with grade level accuracy, for the most part, provided there's not other things going on uh, within this kiddo or adult but a remediated dyslexic, meaning someone who's had good intervention, will still likely read slowly and will still probably need a low distraction environment in order to read um, you know, accurately and, and with less sort of exhaustion and effort. With proper help, many people with dyslexia can learn to read and write well. And the International Dyslexia Association, the Learning Disabilities Association of America, and understood.org are all great resources to find out more about this particular disorder of dyslexia. As I said, there are other things that can impact reading and the evaluation is really the best way to discover exactly what's getting in the way. Um, and these organizations will also help you with uh, some of those other conditions. So LDA understood, even IDA have great uh, resources on the relationship between ADHD and dyslexia or ADHD and its impact on reading. Next. And I'll close with some statistics. So from IDA, about 13 to 14% of the school population nationwide has a handicapping condition that qualifies them for special ed. Current studies indicate that one half of all of the students who qualify for special ed are classified as having a learning disability. And then about, which is six to 7% of all kids who are in schools. And then 85% of those have a primary learning disability in reading and language processing. Uh, nevertheless, though, many more people, perhaps as many as one in five, the International Dyslexia Association says, have some symptoms of dyslexia, including slow or inaccurate reading, poor spelling, poor writing, or they mix up similar words. Not all of those folks will qualify for special education, but they are likely to struggle with many aspects of academic learning and are likely to benefit from that specific type of reading instruction that I talked about. So the IDA, their, their big thing now is one in five, one in five, one in five, one in five. So they're saying that one in five folks will have their educational um, success imperiled by uh, difficulty with reading and they would benefit from this uh, systematic 
multisensory reading instruction. Um, some myths about dyslexia, I don't have a slide for it, but somebody asked me about it today, so I figured I might as well mention it here. People with dyslexia do not reverse letters or read backwards any more than people without dyslexia. That is a myth. People with dyslexia do not have visual processing disorders as a rule. Some people with dyslexia may also have a visual processing disorder, but dyslexia is not a visual processing problem. People with dyslexia are not lazy. They're not poorly parented. This is not because their parents didn't read to them enough. This is not a visual processing disorder. It's absolutely not low IQ. And it is not uncommon, as I said, up to one in five um, will have symptoms of dyslexia with as many as, um, you know, 85% of that 7% uh, will actually be qualify for a diagnosis of dyslexia and uh, need accommodations at school. Thank you. Janet? All right. So that kicks it off to me. <laughs> so I'll talk to you about um, a couple of things. I'm going to talk to you about the Ohio Dyslexia Law, and I'm also going to talk to you about how we seek supports in the school setting. Um, so first, I wanted to start by looking at this beautiful pyramid, <laughs> which sort of helps um, us talk through the different tiers of intervention that are available. Um, and, and this ties into the um, recent developments with the Ohio Dyslexia Law. So Ohio does have this dyslexia law um, that was passed. And the purpose of the law is to um, help identify students early that may have dyslexia tendencies and implement appropriate instruction for those students. Um, so that the um, actual implications of that law really went into effect this year in which school districts needed to start taking certain measures related to the dyslexia law. So this year, um, the school districts had to screen every student in grades K to three um, for dyslexia tendencies and any student in grades four to six upon parents' request. Um, so they were administering a tier one screener. Going forward, beginning next year, um, the law requires them to screen every kindergartner um, after January using that tier one screener. Um, and if a student shows um, some concerns in that tier one screener, the next step is to monitor them for six weeks. And if they're not showing progress with the grade level instruction, then you might then you would step into these tiered interventions. Um, so at the at the bottom of our pyramid is tier one, and this is something that's available to all students. Um, and you'll see here it identifies the. Um, hold on, I'm just letting in a guest. Okay, you'll see here it identifies the universal screening for all kindergartners. The goal is to pre prevent reading failure. Um, tier one whole group. Uh, it's here, and so whole group, small group, and individualized instruction. Um, we would bump up to tier two for those students that are not showing progress. Um, and so here we would likely see our students um, getting some uh, small group instruction. Um, and you'll see here it says it should typically be delivered in 30 to 45 minute blocks, three to five days a week. Um, and if a, if a student continues to not show progress, we would bump them up to tier three, uh, a more intense intervention. There should be fewer students in their pullout group. Um, and, and in the tier, tier three phase, we might be looking to see if there's an underlying disability that requires some IEP intervention. And I'll talk more about that in a minute. Um, something I wanted to note here is that it calls out that the this instruction in the tier two should be delivered in 30 to 45 minute blocks, three to five days a week. Um, for those of us who know about structured literacy programs like Orton Gillingham and Wilson, um, in order for those programs to be delivered with fidelity, and here fidelity means that the protocols of those reading instruction programs have certain sort of rules about how they're delivered. So in order for it to be delivered with fidelity, where we would expect it to be most effective, we're typically looking at those sessions being about 
45 minutes. Um, and oftentimes we're talking about at least three times a week. Um, in some programs, it really target four to five days a week. Um, and again, if you guys can mute, that would be so helpful. Thank you. I'll look and see if I can help with a, a reminder to mute. Um, you my channel, but. Oh, let's see. I think I got it. Okay, great. So um, one of, and that's like one of my tips when I'm working with families and we're getting, we're advocating for reading instruction. Um, if the district is offering reading instruction, making sure it's being offered um, with the right frequency and the right duration of time. So oftentimes we'll see IEPs where, OT is, is um, you're getting a direct OT service for like 20 minutes or, or direct speech and language service for 20 minutes. And so it might feel natural to have that reading intervention be 20 minutes, but really we know these programs delivered with fidelity should be about 45 minutes, um, 30 to 45 minutes. Okay, so the Ohio um, dyslexia law also requires school districts to be delivering a structured literacy program. Um, and that's what I was just talking about is these programs that um, have these certain parameters around how they're delivered, but structured literacy programs are um, explicit, systematic, research-based reading instruction that, folk, that cover phonics, semantics, and syntax. Um, mm -hmm. And the law also requires that all teachers in grades kindergarten through third grade are certified are certified in reading instruction. So I'm just going to talk more about reading um, school based supports. So I was just showing you the those sort of tiers of intervention. Um, and so here's three sort of categories of school based supports. The first would be interventions. Um, and a popular one that you might be familiar with is a reading improvement plan. Um, and this is often tied to the third grade reading guarantee. So if a student through their map testing or whatever other testing um, system the school district uses is showing some deficits in reading compared to their grade level peers, they may be put on a reading improvement plan, which is meant to, um, to close their gap on their reading skills so that they are on track for the third grade reading guarantee. I and So that's one way you end up on the reading improvement plan. I think the other way is gonna be through the me these measures we're utilizing through the dyslexia law. So if you are not showing good progress on these screeners, you might also find yourself on a reading improvement plan. Um, I remember, just to share a personal story, when my daughter's first grade teacher called me to tell me that she was gonna be on a reading improvement plan. And she called me and I could hear the trepidation in her voice that she was about to drop this potential bomb on me. Um, and as soon as she said it, I said, oh, thank goodness. I am going to be a very happy parent about this. You will get no flack from me. I am so grateful that you guys have identified that she has this need and that we're addressing it and we're addressing it early. So if you do get that phone call from your um, teacher, don't panic. I think it's good news. It means that they're doing the right things. Um, the other ways that you can get some additional support in the school setting are through Section 504 plans and individualized education programs, often called IEPs for short. <clears throat> so a quick comparison of the two. Um, I won't spend too much time on this slide. We do make the slides available. Um, online afterwards. Um, but IEPs are born out of the um, Individuals with Disabilities in Education Act, um, and Section 504 plans are actually born out of the Rehabilitation Act. So the two programs are pretty similar, but they have some distinct differences, and a lot of that ties back to the fact that they are born out of two different laws. Um, IEPs are only available for students in the K-12 setting. Um, so it, that is until you graduate or turn 22. Um, Section 504 protections are actually lifelong protections. So the accommodations that you experience in school could carry over to college and then carry over to the workforce. Um, 
The eligibility criteria for the two are different, and I'll look at we'll look at the IEP eligibility criteria here in a minute. Um, Section 504 plan criteria um, is that the individual has a disability that significantly impacts a major life function. Um, and what is included in these plans? Both plans include accommodations um, and can include related services. The difference between an IEP and a 504 plan in terms of how the student is being supported is that IEP plans will, um, IEPs will include specially designed instruction. And that's really kind of a hinge point for whether or not a student should be on a 504 or an IEP. Does their disability require that they receive some specially designed instruction to help remediate that disability? And I think this is where we start to see our students um, that are struggling with reading be, um, be identified as needing an IEP because they need some instruction that is specially designed for them that's not being made available in the whole group setting. Um, so they need some sort of structured literacy program that is specially designed for their learning disability in a small pullout group, for example. Um, so that's where we see um, students that qualify for IEPs under the category of specific learning disability and reading. What I think is very interesting about the dyslexia law as we're watching it sort of play out now that it's being implemented in schools is in the past, maybe like five years ago, we would have seen a student with dyslexia-like tendencies and needed to pivot them onto an IEP um, to access that specially designed instruction. With this new law in place, because it is requiring school districts to have structured literacy programs, um, we may see more students that aren't pivoted to an IEP because the district is already has as a baseline a structured literacy program in place. And then potentially when that student is identified with dyslexia tendencies could be shifted to a small group intervention, which is using a program that's more like OG or Wilson. And so therefore targeting their needs as a student at risk for dyslexia. So it's interest, it will be interesting to see how this plays out if this means that more students are identified under an IEP or that less students are identified because the school district is making um, the instruction, the reading instruction that's appropriate for students at risk for dyslexia available more widespread. So it, it'll be an interesting little dance as we're working with school districts. And for me, what I tell parents is at the end of the day is we need the right instruction, right? Um, and if they're getting the right instruction through these interventions, that's great. And if we have some reassurance that that instruction will continue, that's the key. Because as Dr. Chase already mentioned, dyslexia is a lifelong condition. We're not going to provide um, dyslexia-based instruction for a couple of years and see the symptoms go away. They will continue to they will continue to have dyslexia, and so I want to make sure those resources are available to them as long as possible. And the most secure way to do that is through an IEP. All right. Okay, so this is a snapshot of the um, process for getting an IEP. Um, and so I'm gonna walk you through this really quick. So the first step in the process is for the parents to request an evaluation. That request should always be done in writing because this sets off a series of events in which the district has to complete things in a certain amount of days. And so we always want a clear timestamp on when you made that request for an IEP. Um, so after you request an IEP, the district has 30 days to respond. This means they have 30 days to say, yes, we will complete assessments to explore whether the student is eligible for an IEP or no, we won't. And the way that is typically done is through what's called, um, often called a suspicion meeting. So the school district will invite you to a meeting with the school team and they will discuss whether or not the school team suspects that the student has a disability that is imp impeding their ability to learn or function in the school setting. Um, the important part about that meeting is this is the question is whether or not do we whether or not we suspect, not whether or not we know. And I think sometimes that conversation can start to sound like we know, like we don't. And 
And it's not that definitive because the next step is assessments. And I, you can't really make a determination about whether or not we know that student has a disability that's impacting them at school until we've done comprehensive assessments. So when you're in that meeting, um, it's important as a parent advocate to make sure that the team is asking the right question, whether we suspect, whether there are um, red flags, things that we have seen through testing or class performance that indicate that this student is struggling with reading. Do we suspect there's something impacting them in the school setting? The other important thing to know about this is it's not just a question about academics. It's also a question about social emotional, emotional interactions at school. So you can have a student that's displaying strong academics, but still may need an IEP. So if this conversation is heavily focused on academics, but ignoring behaviors that that student might be showing or how they interact with other folks in the school setting, then that conversation has been too narrowed to academics and we need to look at the whole student in the school setting. That's okay. a great point. And if I can ask yep. you just real quick, Janet, can sure. you speak to, related to that? Can you speak to the work the parents are doing at home that maybe the school doesn't see? So the grades might be okay, but the parents are really, really doing a ton of work at home. Is that yeah. part of the information that should be shared? Yeah. This feels like a Bermuda Triangle to me. So let me just walk you through it. Um, definitely you should be telling the school team what you are doing at home to support the student. If you're doing therapy at home, you're supporting the student through tutoring, um, We should you should definitely be sharing that. Um, what, the reason why I say it feels like a Bermuda Triangle is because with reading specifically, a pattern that I often see is that the student begins to show some deficits in reading. The parents get very concerned, rightfully so, and they start implementing private tutoring outside of school. And that student starts to show progress in their reading. And so when we go to evaluate with the school team, do we think we suspect a disability? They're gonna show you all this data that they're doing great at reading. And really they're doing great because you're bolstering their reading with tutoring. Um, and so they're not showing that reading deficit at school. And that becomes really difficult territory to navigate because the truth of the law is that this whole process is based on what they see in the school setting. And so if they're seeing reading progress in the school setting, and they're not appropriately identifying that it's related to an outside tutoring, you almost get in a situation where your student needs to fail in school before they can get that IEP. And that's a terribly difficult situation to be in. It's actually one of the reasons why I really love that we actually have this dyslexia law in place. And we're telling schools you need to have structured literacy programs because I, I would love to, as much as we can, leave families out of this difficult choice of, do I implement reading and reading instruction outside of school or do I let them flounder until the school recognizes that they need an IEP? Um, the biggest and I problem- I see it as well. I see it yeah. as well. Yeah. And I think the biggest problem with that is time is, a, is of the essence. Mm -hmm. So Dr. Chase already said, don't wait and see, right? Like trust your gut. And my daughter's in second grade now. And I was a year ago in that place where I was being told to wait and see, but all of my, all of my mom read, um, alarm bells were going off. And so I did trust my gut and I pushed a lot to get her into some reading interventions. Um, the reason why I say time is of the essence is we teach our kids to read from K to third grade. And then at fourth grade, we shift from learning to read to reading to learn. And so now in fourth grade, we need to have sustained reading skills because that's how we're going to learn in all of our other subject matters. Um, when we get to fourth grade and we don't have a good foundation in reading, our poor reading is now going to impact us across the board on academics. So it, it is kind of a time imperative um, uh, skill set. Okay. So you're going to have a suspicion meeting. The team's going to decide whether or not we suspect there's a disability impacting the kid, kiddo in the school setting. And then the next phase is to move on to assessment. Um, oftentimes you will have a planning meeting where the school team and the family um, outlines which assessments are going to be completed and by whom. 
Um, those assessments typically are a psychological assessment, um, an educational assessment, and then you can get into some more specialized assessments like an occupational therapy assessment, a speech and language as uh, assessment, um, physical therapy. So all of the um, planning for that happens at a planning meeting. And then you'll see from day 30 to day 90, the district has 60 days to complete those assessments. And those are completed into what is called an evaluation team report. One of the many acronyms we deal in all the time, also called an ETR, evaluation team report. And so once that report is completed, the team will come back together to review that report together and determine whether or not that student is eligible for an IEP. So if the student is found eligible for an IEP, the school district has 30 days to draft and implement an IEP. So you should be scheduling an IEP meeting in the coming weeks and at day 30, the IEP needs to be ready to implement. Once you have an IEP in place, you will do an annual IEP review every 365 days. And then every three years, the student will be up for a reevaluation. In between those times, a parent can always call an IEP meeting. So if you're on an IEP and something's amiss, something's not working, you are empowered and I encourage you to call a team meeting with your IEP team and talk about what's happening and whether or not you need to tweak supports. Okay, so here's a quick look at IEP eligibility. Um, so once we get that evaluation team report back, we're gonna look through that report. And the first question we're going to ask is does the student have one of 13, um, one, does the student's needs fit into one of 13 disability categories outlined by the law? Um, and in fact, I would say this is kind of 13 and a half because there is a developmental delay category which was it used to be through age six and is now actually through age 10. The law changed about a year ago. Um, so that's another category that's often used for our young kiddos as we're still sort of crystallizing what their diagnosis may be. Um, so some common disability categories, other health impairment is where you often find your kiddos with ADHD or anxiety that's impacting them significantly at school, um, autism, uh, kiddos with speech and language disorder, uh, those often with our young kiddos, and then you'll see that they phase out of that and hopefully shift to another category. Um, and then the one we're talking about today would be specific learning disability. So you can have a specific learning disability, for example, in reading or a specific learning disability in something like math. Um, so the question is gonna be, does that student fall into one of these disability categories? Um, and, Let's see if I can find it in this small type. Hold on just a second, guys. Um, the and, so the child, so you'll see it here. It's this last checkbox. The child demonstrates an educational need that requires specifically designed instruction. So we talked about that earlier, the specifically designed instruction. So does this disability impact them in the school setting such that they need specifically designed instruction? And then here's the structure of your of an IEP. So when you get to that phase, um, the IEP is broken up into several parts and I'm just gonna walk you through the high points. Um, so first is the profile. All of that wonderful information that they got in the, in the evaluation team report will go into the profile um, in a sort of shorter, more succinct way. But this is where you really wanna capture the essence of the student's learning profile understand that an IEP travels with the student. So when that student's in second grade, their school team, their second grade teacher is responsible for knowing that IEP. And then when that student goes to third grade, this document goes with them. So I'm always thinking about if I was reading this for the first time, does this document help me understand what this student needs to help them be successful in school? So the profile should include things like summaries of assessments, um, that were important for showing that student's learning profile and other areas of need. Um, we usually include some things about their strengths or their likes because, you know, some students that really need preferred activities to engage in learning, it's important to have some of that background as well. The next step phase of the IEP is the goal section. And each goal section will have um, 
several pieces of information, including the present level of performance. So that's where the student is currently performing on that particular goal. Um, something that I check for in all of my IEPs are dates, dates, dates. So if you reference back to an ETR, I want to know what date that ETR is. I want to know what date an assessment was done. And in the present level of performance, I want to know if there's like MAP testing or iReady testing, the date that that was administered. Um, I also want to know what the grade level expectation is. So sometimes I will look at a present level of performance and it will list all of the students' current scores, but it doesn't tell me what grade level is. And if I'm a parent and I'm not well versed in testing, I don't know what that means without the benchmark of the grade level expectation. The next piece will be that it will um, provide a goal. Sometimes that goal is broken up into objectives. Um, and then you need a method for measuring progress um, and, and objectives. So these the important thing here is that they're measurable. We really need a way to quantify this. How are we gonna track progress in a meaningful way? Um, and that helps them create the progress reports which help us track whether this student is making good progress under the IEP. Um, then you will have your specially designed instruction. This is where we're gonna outline what that specially designed instruction looks like. Related services. So do you need things like occupational therapy, speech and language, physical therapy to help support the goals in the IEP? Accommodations, which we'll talk about accommodations in a second. Modifications and then placement, least restrictive environment. So this is whether the student's going to be in the general ed setting for these for um, their school day, or are they going to be in small group for certain parts of their school day? So that would be a student who's um, mostly in the general ed education setting, but gets pulled out for small group instruction um, for certain areas of need, or whether that student will be in like a self-contained small group for the entire day, or some of our students that really get placed outside of the district um, in non-district schools because they have very specific needs. Um, and then the last section will be extended school year, and this is whether or not the student qualifies for services over the summer. Okay, and this is just a quick look at accommodations, some common accommodations that I see. Um, things like uh, prompts. Uh, so some of our students need reminding to go back to their whatever task that it is that they're working on. Visual supports. Um, so uh, a visual schedule is an example of a visual support. Um, breaks, breaks can be very important, um, especially like you think about a struggling reader, if they just went through a pullout for 45 minutes where they were really sort of exercising their brain hard because this is a subject where they struggle, let's give that kid a break. And that's when we ask for a time for a scheduled break. Um, sometimes it will just say breaks or it'll say breaks as needed depending on the age of the student and how good of a self-advocate they are, I often ask for scheduled breaks. And that's the best way for us to know that that true to, student's truly getting breaks. Um, extended time, small group testing, preferential seating. We talked about related services, things like OT, PT, speech, um, and modifications. Okay, so my hot tips for being um, a good parent advocate. Um, the first is be collaborative. And I think this is sometimes easier said than done. Um, watching your students struggle, your child struggle is difficult, but a really important component of being on the IEP team is being collaborative. Um, one of the reasons why I always say this is should I ever end up in a due process case with a family? And that's essentially when we are litigating a problem with the student's IEP, um, one of the go-to complaints a district might raise is that the family was not cooperative. They didn't cooperate with the IEP. They didn't cooperate with the school team. So it's really important to maintain a, a demeanor of, collaborative, of being collaborative. Um, for the clients that I work with, this is my, this is how I operate. And I often will tell them, um, I'm not like a fire and brimstone attorney. You won't see me dramatically banging on a table like they show them in the movies and TV. My job is to really leave your school team in a better place than they were when I found them. So I'm going to go in, I'm going to seem very friendly. That's going to be my tone on purpose. I'm going to be very collaborative. 
But when I need to make a point or when I need to be firm about something, it's going to be more effective because I do have a collaborative approach. A big part of what I do is about relationships. Um, everything in writing. So I mentioned that earlier, when you make your requests to the school team, put it in writing. Um, there's lots of reasons for that. First, time stamping things. So we know how quickly they're responding. The other is that you will find over time that your student's education journey will be full of documentation. <laughs> so being able to refer back to something you sent in writing um, and understand the timeline and the progression of what went on with your kiddo in school, it really helps when we do, when we have those communications in writing. Um, don't sign right away. The reason why I say this is if you're ever in an IEP meeting or a 504 plan meeting, it is just a natural progression to go from reviewing the document to signing it. And sometimes parents have trepidation, but they don't feel empowered to say, wait, I want to take this home and read it over and bring it back to you later. But you always have that right and feel free to exercise it. Um, I just want to empower you to do that. Um, bring a support person. So I exist for that reason. We have an education advocate that exists for that reason, but also anybody. So if you don't, you know, maybe you're not at a place where you need an advocate. Maybe you um, don't think you can afford an advocate. Get, just get a warm body, <laughs> right? Like I think sometimes um, it can be very daunting because the school team has several people on its team. And then you um, as the parent are there by yourself and really just having another person in the room with you um, is very empowering, but also it's very emotional talking about our kids and their needs and where they're struggling. And so having another set of ears there to hear what you might've missed or to hear what you heard differently, it's a really helpful to unpack that later and make sure you like really understand what happened during that meeting. Um, IEP meetings are full of terminology that we don't use every day. Um, talking about educational assessments and other assessments and um, goals, it all can feel like a foreign language. So having another person there is a great way to unpack it later and sort of make your understanding of the meeting more robust. Um, so it's probably one of my biggest pieces of advice is to bring a friend if you can. Um, check the meeting invite for attendees. It's helpful to orient yourself with who's coming, bring relevant records. So this is we talked a little bit about what you're doing outside of school. So if they're meeting with a therapist, if you've done like a screener for dyslexia, um, they're going to tutoring, bring those records. If you start with a tutor, make sure they do an assessment at the outset and they're doing regular benchmark assessments throughout their tutoring process, because that is a helpful tool to bring to the table to say, hey, in January of 2024, this is where my student was. This is where their assessment with their tutor had them. And after three months, look at the progress they made, right? So it's really important that if you're hiring a tutor, ask them what kind of data tracking they do as part of their tutoring. Um, organized records, because <laughs> they, they, there can be a lot of them. Um, write down your concerns before you go into the meeting. It's so easy to forget things in the moment. Um, research your child's condition if you're not familiar with it. Um, and be prepared for emotional advocacy. What I mean by emotional advocacy is what I said earlier. These are our kiddos. We care about them passionately, passionately and deeply. It is not uncommon to cry. Don't get rattled if you cry. It's okay to cry in an IEP meeting. I tell my clients, you can cry. I'm here to keep like my head in the game. So just be prepared for those emotional moments. You might get rattled. You might hear the tone of your voice change. Don't let it throw you when the emotions come to the surface. Um, extracurriculars, remember to ask questions about extracurriculars. I think it's easy to overlook if you have a kiddo that's involved in it. The school to home connection. Collab this goes kind of back to what I was talking about collabor in collaboration, but it's really important for our kiddos that we have a strong school to home connection. So what they're doing in school, transferring that to home and vice versa. Um, so if there's a strategy that's working well in school, try to use that same strategy at home. If you have a strategy that works well at home, try to use that same strategy in school. Um, a great example is my daughter, struggling reader, as I've already identified. When she reads at home, it's 
like a nightmare. <laughs> She's a very resistant reader. She fights me. She cries. She kicks. Like it's a very dramatic experience sometimes reading with my kiddo. But what I hear from her teachers is that she is engaged and she volunteers to read out loud, which I almost fell out of my chair when they told me that. And I asked them to double check they were talking about the right kiddo. Um, and so their experience with her reading is night and day from my experience. So what kind of strategies can I borrow from them to help our experience at home be better? Because one of the biggest struggles we've had is that she needs more practice, but she's so resistant to practicing at home. So sometimes I'm like, we're just going to take you to the library and let you read to the librarian, or maybe you can read to a younger kid, right? Just put her in a situation where she's less stressed about reading. So borrow some of those strategies from the school. Um, and then last, social emotional matters, which I already talked about, but when we get too focused on academics, we sometimes miss our kids' social emotional needs at school, and they do matter for the IEP process. Okay, <clears throat> so that brings me to the end of my part of the presentation. Um, I think I just want to highlight again for everyone to trust your gut, and I tell all of my clients that, that parent instinct matters. It's not scientific. It's not sophisticated. We can't pull it up in research but I think it matters. So when something doesn't feel right to you, ask more questions. More information is better. That's why I like to push for assessments when people say that they want a 504 kiddos. Um, but definitely trust your instinct. Um, and don't wait when it comes to reading. We know a lot about the science of reading now, and there's lots of good tools out there. So don't wait to start advocating for your kiddo and, and their reading. And Janet, I'm just going to piggyback onto your comment about trust your gut. Um, you know, you and I are both parents and, um, if you feel, I have a colleague who said this to me when I was a young mom and I was working and she was working and a little bit older mom. And she said, you can only be as happy as your most unhappy child. Oof. Yeah. Isn't that the truth? It yeah. was one of the most moving moments she ever said. And as a parent, I will tell you, like, I can kind of handle my life professionally most of the time. I can handle what's going on. But if I have a concern about one of my kids, it'll hijack my focus and my attention. And it's hard for me to really do much else until I, and I tell families all the time when they call me for an evaluation, get it off your mind, answer the question. Maybe there's nothing going on, but wouldn't you want to know? Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. if there is something going on, let's get the help that we need. But I will tell you that the risk of underreacting in a situation like this is greater than the risk of reacting. I don't think you can overreact by simply asking questions and getting an evaluation, but you can definitely underreact. Okay, so we have, um, let me go ahead and turn off our, my share. Um, okay. So we are technically scheduled until eight o'clock. Mm -hmm. So now we have time for questions. Um, I encourage you to remember that we are recording when you ask questions. So if you don't want to share things that are too personal, um, and, uh, if we don't have too many questions, then we'll get to let you go early. Um, so I do see one question in this, in the chat, feel free to type questions in the chat if you'd like. Um, or you can unmute and we'll take your question that way. Um, so this question says, if a student is getting SDI on their IEP for basic reading, so if they're getting, they have an IEP for reading and so they're getting specially designed instruction, what is the requirement of the district to offer with respect to the new dyslexia law? So I would say if your student is already on an IEP, then they've already worked through the tiers um, that I showed you earlier, and they've already done the things required by the dyslexia law. They've already done some form of a screener. They've already tied that student into some um, reading intervention. And now they're sort of at the highest level of reading intervention, which is that SDI on an IEP. Um, so I think they've already worked through the motions of what's required under the dyslexia law. So a student who's on an IEP is, are, is already getting what they need. This law is really targeted at identifying 
and delivering proper instruction because there were too many kids who weren't getting that IEP, right? There were too many kids and not even just IEPs, but like there were too many kids who weren't getting interventions. Um, and so the purpose of this law is to identify kiddos and identify them early and then get interventions in place early. A kiddo that's on an IEP has already made it to that moment, right? And then I think what I would be doing is just be like a vigilant protector of that IEP to make sure that my kiddo continues to get that reading instruction they need. Um, because as I said, as we're watching this play out, um, I don't know if that kiddo would get an IEP now because we're because the law is requiring this structured literacy program and these interventions. And that may be sufficient. That may be great. Um, I like the security blanket of the IEP because it, it formally requires a certain amount of intervention in a certain interval. So it likely would say something like 30 minutes a day, three times a week, like that requirement is cemented and very clear and it carries over year to year. And I want to add on to that real quick. So I've seen it. I've been part of school meetings where the IEP may say 30 minutes, three days a week, for example. But when you start to scratch the surface and you find out that, but if there's an assembly, that's the first thing that gets dropped. Or if uh, the student was out sick, they don't make up that time. So if it's written on the IEP, that's great. I mean, that is a great first start. But if you're not seeing progress, I certainly invite you to go back to the team and say, let's reconvene, let's talk again. I'd like to see what the actual implementation is. It might be on the IEP, yeah. but I have seen it where it wasn't actually implemented that way. Oh, she needed more time on her math test. So instead of going to intervention, she came back to the math teacher and finished her math test. And so even though it's three times a week for 30 minutes or whatnot, in actuality, three times a week was only happening about once a month. So yeah. hopefully yeah. we're getting yeah. better, but I have seen that. Right. And I've seen it too. So if the IEP calls for three times a week for 30 minutes, it means three times a week for 30 minutes. It does not have an asterisk on it that says, but for an assembly or, but for your kid is sick. It means right. three times for 30 minutes every week. And if it's not happening, you're owed compensatory time. So right. that right. is part of the beauty of the IEP is it's like, it's a legal document. It's a legal contract between you and the school district. And so mm -hmm. they do have an obligation. I've seen where a school district had a policy of like not making up the time when the student was sick or there was an assembly. And because it was a policy, now it was like a systemic violation of IDEA. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. if it's on the IEP, it's owed to your student. And there may even be, which is why I think an evaluation is so critical, there may even be a place to receive some additional support so there's not a big loss over summer. Yes, yeah, yep, yep, that's so true. And I the, I think the other point about this is once you have the IEP in place, we certainly can all take a sigh of relief, like we've made it through a dis difficult, stressful process. Um, mm -hmm. But the progress monitoring is important because if for some reason the student's not getting traction with that form of instruction, we need to go back and look at it and see what we can do to make the instruction more effective. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, this another question, what is the next step if the district acknowledged my re request for an evaluation, but they haven't followed up with a suspicion meeting and it's been more than 30 days? So a couple of things to note about that. Um, weekends and holidays don't matter for that 30 day count. So some, we just go back and look at your calendar. You might be at day 28. Um, I always like to double check that before I call the district attorney and say, Hey, you're past the 30 days. Cause egg on your face if you're not. Um, so just double check the calendar. And then, um, the, if they're past the 30 days, they're technically, it's a procedural violation, right? There, the law requires a certain amount of days for a reason and they're in violation. And so my next email would be to them to say, Hey, you're in violation of IDEA because you haven't responded to this request. Or it seems like, I like to soften my language sometimes to be more collaborative. It seems like we might be in violation of IDEA because this request was sent on September 1st and it's now, you know, November, October 15th, right? Um, is it because my son attends a private school and the same rules don't apply? So private school is a little bit of a confusing territory because 
you're not at the district, so they don't have IDEA obligations to your student, but the district is still involved in the evaluation process. So it could be that if you sent the request to the private school, it's not going to the right person. If you're asking for your student to be evaluated and they're at private school, you should be going to the school district. Um, I, I did, I did send it to the district. Okay. Well, if you think you're past the days, I think you it's time for an email and a phone call and copy the special education director or the director of pupil services. Um, and then the other trick is that sometimes there is confusion over the district of residence and the district of service. The district of residence is where you live. The district of service is where the school district is. Oh email yeah, we have that. We have that whole mess, but yeah, we've got yeah. that. We're yeah. in the right place. It's just... Yep. My principal so, said it might just be because they don't want to service me quickly because I'm not in their districts. <laughs> well, it, it's time to follow up and start copying okay. the higher ups. All yep. right. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, Janet, I see this next one. And if you don't mind, I'm going to yeah. address it ahead Do of you it. here. Yep. Uh, um, working with a family with a second grader who's struggling with the components of reading since kindergarten. Um, essentially, he's re receiving instruction, it's quality instruction, but making minimal progress. And the recommendation is that he repeat a grade. I want to jump in here um, as a psychologist in private practice. Um, so I consult with so school psychologists around the country. I actually go to Texas, for example, and train the school psychologists how to do the evaluations in their state and what to look for in the data. There's an awful lot of pressure, in my opinion, on school psychologists to get everything right and to know everything about everything. And I don't think that's fair. I think it's actually appropriate. I have school districts who will contact me and say, we want to send you a youngster that we're not seeing a whole lot of progress on. They will actually engage me uh, preemptively. Um, it doesn't happen a lot, but parents are allowed to ask for an independent outside evaluation. And in yeah. cases like this, to me, we need to make sure maybe there's not also a working memory problem, an attention mm -hmm. problem, or some condition that maybe I in private practice with a PhD and years in hospital-based experience and things, maybe I've seen that before, that the school psych may not have a lot of experience with, and that's not by anyone's fault. It's just different degrees <laughs> and different training. So in a case like this, I, again, my, my recommendation before retaining is to get a full evaluation, ideally by a psychologist, neuropsychologist, or an outside psychologist who yeah. has a broad, a, a broad net that he or she can cast and looking at all the different variables that might be impacting academic performance versus the schools where, you know, they're their, their focus is on do you qualify, do you not qualify? Whereas somebody like myself, my, my goal is to look at what are the variables leading to the challenges or the successes and how do we you know leverage the, the strengths to overcome the weaknesses? Yeah, and an important aspect of what you just shared is the independent educational evaluation, just to make sure everyone knows what that is. Um, after a school district completes the evaluation team report, which is what we use to determine whether they're eligible, if for some reason um, you disagree with that, with their ETR, you can request an independent educational evaluation. Um, and that is what she just described, where like a third party comes in and does their own battery of assessments. And we bring that, we bring the school team back together to review that third party assessment and make a, a adjustments accordingly to the student's IEP. Um, I think it's a really great tool. Um, first, it's a really great parent advocacy tool, but it's also a really great tool when a team is stuck. Mm -hmm. When we're like trying to help a kiddo and we're not getting traction and we're not sure where to go, it, it's like getting a second assessment. Um, so I do them for ETRs. I do them for functional behavior assessments. I, I just think it's a really great way to get more information and and just another set of eyes, right? Because what you just said, this person may have a different background, a different type of um, practical experience that will be a different perspective. Absolutely. And there was a follow-up here. Parent inquired into an outside evaluation, but there was a long wait later than the end of the school year. Lots of people are on a long wait. Lots of people yeah. are not. It just it just depends. I mean, you know, I, I have 
Um, myself, I mean, I'm, I'm seeing people in a matter of a couple of weeks. So it just really depends on who you're calling, what the referral issue is. Um, and, you know, you don't, the school may offer you suggestions uh, out of helping you out, but you are not at all beholden to only use those people that were suggested. So yeah. I would talk to parent advocates, talk to Hickman Lauder, talk to the International Dyslexia Association website has a list of providers. The Cleveland Psychological Association has providers. Uh, and so you, you've got lots of places that you can dig around and ask and, and, you know, not everybody is on a wait that's six to 12 months. Yeah. And the wait is a problem in many areas from like initial autism assessment to getting an IEE. Autism is um, really tricky right now. Yeah. Yeah. Super tricky. Um, and, you know, sometimes the answer is we need to wait to get a, a really good IEE. Um, so sometimes I'm targeting a specific IEE provider for a student. Um, and that's where someone like myself or reaching out to your community, like if you have a parent community that you're tapped into, um, to see who's had good experiences with certain providers. Mm -hmm. um, knowing that you don't have to go with the school suggested list, you can identify your own provider. Um, the important thing about an IEE is that the school district pays for it. Um, so I think sometimes parents feel like they have to go with their list because the district's paying for yeah, it, but you right. can find your own provider. Um, and then timing, because we do sometimes have a wait. If you're making an IEE request in the spring um, and it looks like you're not going to get it done by the end of the school year or you're going to be doing components of it in that last two weeks where kids start to have summer brain, wait. You know, like let's let's talk to the school team about waiting until we've started the new school year and we're in a place where we're going to get the best baseline for your student. So if I have a student that we're requesting an IEE for and we're starting at the beginning of the school year and they need to come in and do observations, I'm going to ask them to wait like four to six weeks. Let's get past the honeymoon period where school is new and we're coming off a summer break and let's get into like those normal school days. So if you do find yourself in a waiting pattern, Think strategically about when you're pulling the trigger then, when your provider says they're ready, is this the right time to be observing my kiddo in school? Mm -hmm. But just remember, not everybody's on a long wait like that. Yeah. yeah. I know, yeah. Uh, particularly for reading, you know, if you call yeah. and you were specific, I need to get a reading eval, um, you might be surprised that people can get you in quicker than if you're calling for an autism eval. So Yeah. That's so true. If it's not like a full comprehensive evaluation. Correct. Yeah. yeah and totally. like when I do IEEs, um, I start with the school IQ tests and things like that. I might not have to repeat any of right. that. It just depends how old it is and what the findings were and, and things like that. So um, again, I, you know, I have people come from, so I, I'm what's called SIPAC certified. So I can see people in over 40 different states. And um, so, I mean, I've got, you know, folks that I'm seeing in Texas and Buffalo and Minnesota and Seattle and things like that, that, you know, we can get these things done in a pretty timely manner. Um, mm -hmm. And I would just keep, keep asking around to find people who can, who can see your kiddo. The reason I brought that up is because yes, look at the requirements within your um, school district on who can do the evaluations, but you know, if, if time is of the essence here, if you feel like I, you know, boy, they're saying it's going to be a year, you can go where you want to go or go where you need yeah. to go. So yeah. I've had, like I said, I, I've even had before I was IPAC certified, I had people come over from other states and then stay while I wrote up the results. And then they would take them back to their home state and they had an evaluation done. So it worked. Yeah, that's great. I love that. It's great advice. You do what you got to do, man. It's your kid. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. And I do think the point about time of, of the, is of the essence is important because a lot of these kids can't wait, right? Like it might be my autistic kiddo who needs really good early intervention and early intervention has a window naturally because mm. it's early intervention, right? Like mm -hmm. early intervention for reading, balancing waiting with who's doing your um, mm -hmm. evaluation is an important consideration. Mm -hmm. Um what is the relationship between a RIMP and the screening that would be done per the new dyslexia law? Is a RIMP the outcome of a screening of screening a student and determining that they need a RIMP to see if they make progress? Um, so again, we're, this is sort of new to all of us, but 
my under what I would expect is that the screening is going to help uncover who needs a rim. Um, so let, you know, like when my daughter was going through this, it was her Acadian scores that were determining whether she qualified for a RIMP um, or whatever standardized testing the school district is using to assess reading skills. Um, so they would, you know, be looking at that testing and if they fall in the red or a certain, you know, like below benchmark, they would then tee that student up for a reading improvement plan. I would expect that the screeners that we're now using as a result of the dyslexia law would be a, a data point that would direct us to put a student on a reading improvement plan. I'm going to, um, there's one that we kind of skipped over, but I'm, yeah. let's get back to that one in a second, because this is a follow-up to the IEE discussion that we had. Um, if the, I know I had a long question and I feel we're doing everything as suggested for the meeting next week. If they refuse to evaluate, can the parent refuse retention? Hmm. That's a more nuanced, I, don't, I think, question. Yeah. yeah, I think it's very nuanced. I also think there isn't a, there isn't a direct parental right, right? Like there's certain um, correct, parental rights that are spelled out and very clear. I think this is a moment of advocacy. This is a moment where you're you're gonna say, if my kid is not struggling enough that you will evaluate them, then I can't see justifying retaining them, right? Like it's counterintuitive for those two things to exist at the same time. If that you're- That was a really, really wise statement. Mm -hmm. If they're not struggling enough to evaluate them, how are they struggling enough to be retained? Yeah, right. <laughs> Yeah. And I think the other point I would make is if you're retaining my kid, we need to have an intelligent approach to, to um, progress. And the IEP is the tool for that. And so we have to assess them, right? And here's the other thing. If they are behind enough that they need to be retained, that is your suspicion of a disability. <laughs> yeah. We don't need to know that they have a disability. There's your suspicion right there right? Like the two questions answer themselves. Right. So yeah, I, I would, you know, what's really tough is when they choose not to evaluate, there's not a lot of recourse for parents. You can file due process, which is an extreme measure, but this might be a case where I would be willing to do that. Sure. Sure. And then the one that we inadvertently skipped over because it was sort of embedded yep. within my kiddo is regressing. We do not know why. We have a meeting on Friday with the teacher and small group teacher. They cannot suggest a tutor, but we would be willing to do this. We graduated therapy. I'm wondering if we can ask for a dyslexia screen evaluation or sounds like we might need a neuropsych evaluation. Yeah. Um so if this kiddo is already on an IEP, then I would be asking for an IEE. Um, and the interesting thing about an IEE is the law does not say, does not provide a deadline for when you can ask for it. Um, so you, when you complete your evaluation team report, the next time you would look at doing assessments again would be in three years. So I typically say, if you're about at one, at a year and a half, two year mark, up to that point, I feel very comfortable asking for an IEE. Um, if you're past that point, you're getting closer to the triennial review time. So it might be appropriate to ask for a new ETR and to just do it early. Um, but I think that's a tool available. Um, another tool that I've used personally is um, there are some places out there that will do a free reading screener. And I think this is helpful so that parents can get their own um, information and bring it to the school. So the Schaefer Center at Lawrence School does a free reading screener. Um, Dr. Chase might know about some other places, but I think that's a helpful way to get your own information because we're oftentimes so reliant on the schools for information. Yeah. Yeah. Schaefer does them. And, um, you know, one of the things, keep in mind, the purpose of a screener is to catch something if it's there. Okay. So, if I'm screening for depression, I'm going to ask a lot of questions. And if just a couple of them are yeses, then my recommendation is let's follow up. 
and do be a little more thorough, right? It's because I want to catch it if it's there. If someone's depressed, the point of a screener is to catch it if it's there. This is mm -hmm. also the point of these reading screeners is to catch it if it's there. So there will be a lower threshold to say, hey, there's something here and we should follow up with it. And so simply having a child who goes to a screener that says you should follow up with this doesn't automatically, you do not have a dyslexia diagnosis based on the screener. What you have is enough evidence to suggest we should follow up more. So don't mm -hmm. get yourself too keyed up if the school says, well, we don't find anything there when they do the full evaluation. But the screener is supposed to catch it if it's there. Now, relatedly, then don't be afraid to contact an outside psychologist or ask for the IEE and say, here's what the school data was. Can you supplement this data, add anything to it? What are you seeing is going on? Because in my experience, if a child is struggling academically, there's usually things that we can find that we can do to improve how they're doing. Doesn't mean they qualify for services in their, you know, in their school program or whatnot, maybe not. But as a parent, mm -hmm. somebody like me in private practice is going to say, you know what? Get a tutor a couple of days a week. You know what? Get them audio books. You know what? Let's get some psychotherapy in there because their anxiety is through the roof. You know what? Let's try some, you know, let's look for ADHD or whatever. So, so as I said, somebody like me casts a much broader net. Mm -hmm. And so mm -hmm. again, if the screener raises concern, but you go to the eval and school says, eh, we don't see anything that they qualify for. I, I would not stop barking. I would just say, okay. Well, they didn't see that she qualified for anything, but I still feel like maybe there's something going on. The mistake a lot of families make, and it's understandable because you think you've already gone through the experts through the school, but the mistake a lot of families make is say, well, okay, it must be that my child is not trying hard enough, or mm -hmm. maybe she's not paying attention, or maybe there's nothing there and I was just sort of making this up. No, it just means that that particular evaluator in that school district at that time didn't feel or the team didn't feel the child qualified for services. That's not the same thing as there's nothing going on. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's great advice. Um, and that's why the IEEs exist because parents are not education professionals. They're not school psychologists. They don't have the ability um, to assess their children the way the school district does. And so we have IEEs as an advocacy tool for parents. Um, and, and I think it's also hard because you naturally want to and should trust your school team to an extent, right? Yeah, um, yeah. And they spend the most time with your kid, right? And their expertise is teaching your kid. Um, but I think it's appropriate when you have questions that you feel are unanswered to ask for an IEE or to seek out assessments from other individuals. Um, the next question is, do you have to rescind your agreement to the ETR to request one I to request an IEE? So um, that feels like a law school um, exam question. So I, <laughs> I, so, but let me, I, I think I have the answer. So the ETR is the evaluation that the school team completes. An ETR has to be done in order to request an IEE because the purpose of an IEE is a family saying, we don't agree with the results of the ETR. So the ETR has to come first. There has to be an ETR before you can ask for an IEE. If you are at a point where you've agreed to an ETR and it's not complete yet, you're already in process for an ETR. So you're not at a place yet where you can ask for an, an IEE because you don't have a completed ETR. Um, once you have a completed ETR and you review that and you feel you don't agree or you need a deeper dive or something's missing, that's when you can request an IEE. I think. Um, an IEE is something we often use, but um, it's not helpful to talk about an IEE before an ETR is complete, um, because then the school district may feel that you haven't given like fair consideration to their ETR and you were planning to get an IEE all along. Um, so you don't want to come across that way. It's not common that school districts deny an IEE, but it does happen. Um, so you really shouldn't talk about an IEE until you've had time to look at and consider the school team's ETR. 
Oh, after you're a year into the ETR. So once you're already, so the question to clarify, the question is once you are like the ETR has been completed and you're, it's a year later or a year and a half later, um, you're not rescinding agreement to anything when you ask for an IEE. So, the, you know, do you have to rescind your agreement to the ETR? N no, you're not like, what you're saying is I don't agree with components of the ETR. Therefore, I'm asking for an IEE, but you're not formally doing anything that would sort of like take back your IDEA rights under and or like impact your child's IEP or the current ETR. The current ETR exists until we change something about it. And so the process would be that you have a completed ETR, you ask for an IEE, and then oftentimes the school district will reopen the ETR to um, bring in the information from the IEE and then close the ETR again. And then a follow-up point to that, an outside evaluator um, may evaluate and find something significant and make a diagnosis, but that, that doesn't mean that the school has to do anything different. And the way I explain it is this. I, I actually evaluated a kiddo. I know we're short on time, but I'll be, I'll be brief. I evaluated a kiddo, found dyslexia, went to the school district, went to a meeting. The school district actually said, okay, Dr. Chase, we agree with you that the child has dyslexia, but we do not agree that it is a learning disability. And I was, I was a little surprised, but it was a first grader who was largely reading on grade level, but dad was dyslexic, older brother was dyslexic, and he had a lot of the classic red flags. So I was saying we have to get out in front. But the way that the, there's a difference between a disorder and a disability. So if I have a wart on my toe, right? Big wart on the end of my toe. I go to the doctor. The doctor goes, oh, Cheryl, that is not supposed to be there. That is pathological. We're going to treat it with medication. We're going to bill your insurance company. We're going to give it a big, long name with CPT codes and everything. That is atypical, unusual. You have a disorder. But I still go to work tomorrow. Why? Because my disorder is not having a negative functional impact in my work environment. However, if I'm a ballerina, I might not be able to perform for 10 days until my toe heals. So it would be a disability in that environment. So the school then takes whatever the evaluator does privately on the outside and determines whether or not that disorder is having a disabling effect in their environment. And right. in this case, when I did the dyslexia eval, yeah, I see dyslexia, but they were saying they weren't seeing a significant enough functional impact on reading scores at school to make the diagnosis or to, you know, to qualify him. So we just waited a year and then magically, you know, we were able to show that he was stressed out at home. He was struggling with all these other things. So. Right. That's so true. And that's where a lot of our families um, become frustrated with the process is the you know, another way to talk about this is the difference between a medical assessment and a school-based assessment. So your kiddo can be diagnosed with something by a doctor medically, like you just said, diagnosed with dyslexia, but doctors look at the whole child in school and out of school. They're looking at multiple environments. School-based assessments are very specifically looking at how the student presents at school. Mm -hmm. um, and when that presentation is not coming out at school, um, you will find a kiddo doesn't qualify. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, okay. 802, I, thanks everybody for hanging out. Yeah, that was great. Two extra minutes for us. I think we answered all the questions. This was wonderful and phenomenal. Dr. Chase, I appreciate you so much for being here. Thanks um, for asking was, me. Of course, a wonderful wealth of knowledge. So I appreciate everyone for giving us their Wednesday evening. Um, go forth and enjoy the rest of your week. Bye, everybody. Bye.